So I am your host this evening. I am the presenter. My name is Dave Langer. I am the VP of Data Science at Data Science Dojo, which doesn't mean much. It's a small company, so I wear many hats. It's an impressive title. It looks good on my card. What's more important is I have an extensive background in technology, more than 20 years. Uh, I've had many jobs in that time. I've been a developer. I've been an architect. I've been a manager. And most importantly, uh, I've spent quite a bit of time over the years doing BI, data warehousing, and analytics. So traditional, what these days is called descriptive analytics. My last job before coming to Data Science Dojo, I was a senior director at Microsoft where I managed a team of technical program managers that had accountability for all of the data platforms used to run Microsoft's $10 billion plus supply chain. Apparently they're making cool notebooks and laptops now too. I got hooked on data science about, ooh, I guess it's almost six years ago now, when I was getting my master's degree in computer science. I had the privilege of taking an introductory machine learning course from a gentleman who was a member of the second place Netflix prize team. And what he taught me was these assets that I've been working with, my OLAP cubes, my data marts, my data warehouses, all that stuff was great. It allowed me to look backwards in time, what happened in the business, figure out why, understand trends, all that kind of stuff. But he also taught me that I, I could also use those assets as a kind of a crystal ball and look forward in time, what's popularly called predictive analytics these days. And that got me super stoked. Essentially, I got totally addicted and it became an obsession of mine, so much so that my wife called it my second part-time job, doing Kaggle competitions, reading books, studying, doing all kinds of stuff. One aspect of that obsession was a couple years ago, I started a YouTube channel where I put data science tutorials. And in fact, this meetup tonight was inspired by an actual tutorial I have, oddly enough, titled R Programming for Excel Users. So if you like what you hear tonight, you want more depth, more, more content, I've got about six and a half hours of videos up right now. There'll be one last half hour video next week. So seven hours of training total if you're interested in that. So you may be wondering why I would leave such an esteemed position at such a great in company to come work at a small startup. And the answer is to democratize data science. My YouTube channel was started under the idea that you don't need a PhD in machine learning, you don't need a PhD in statistics to learn some data science tools and techniques and then apply them in your day job and get business value. You don't need that. You don't even, you don't even need a bachelor's degree in those two things. So Data Science Dojo's motto is data science for everyone. And that is the company's philosophy. That is our philosophy. This meetup tonight is an example of that. So it was a good meshing of my philosophy and the company's philosophy. So I said, this is the place I want to be. And it gives me an opportunity to talk to all of you nice folks on a sunny, sunny Wednesday evening in April. Who would have thought that? Okay. So what's the motivation for this talk? This graphic is the motivation for this talk. So the IEEE, if you're not familiar with it, is a, the easiest way to think about it is it's an international standards body. One of the things that they worry about or they concern themselves with is computer science. Out of that concern, each year they rank programming languages, which are the most popular programming languages in the world. And what you'll see here is that R is fifth on the list. Now, you may say, so what, Dave? Fifth. <laughs> Who cares? But this is indicative of this thing that I have written over here. R has been experiencing rapid year-over-year -year growth and popularity. Now, if you're not a computer scientist, you may not know this, but just trust me on this. Of these six things, R is distinctly different. These are all general purpose programming languages. For example, you can build operating systems in C, like Windows and Mac OS X. Right? Python, Python's also very popular in data science, as a lot of you may know. But Python actually started as a general purpose programming language. They bolted the data science stuff on later. But R was never that way. R was built from the ground up for statisticians 
by statisticians. It's not a general purpose programming language. It is a specific language for working with data. And that's what makes this so impressive. What that tells me, because it agrees with my bias, is that R is awesome. There's a reason why it's rising in popularity, because it is so useful, because it's cool, and it makes me more productive and allows me to do new and interesting things and deliver business value. That's why it's now more popular than C-sharp. Now, if you don't know what C-sharp is, Microsoft spent billions of dollars on this. Sad face somewhere over in you know, Redmond, right? Sad face. So I would offer this up that as an Excel user, this is indicative of why you may want to be interested in R. Because since it's designed to only work with data, basically, and it's the fifth most popular programming language in the world, that probably means something. Probably means something. Okay, so now that I've given you some, uh, some hard sell on R, let's talk about the expectation settings of this, this particular presentation. So I'm gonna assume the following, which is why I was asking earlier, that you're experienced with Excel, but the only level of experience I'm gonna assume is that you're familiar with tables and formulas and using functions and pivot tables. No VLOOKUPs, no VBA, no macros, nothing fancy like that. Just basic out of the box, clicky, clicky, clicky in Excel. I'm also gonna assume that you're not familiar with R. A lot of you are not, excellent. And that you're interested in learning R, which a lot of you are. And hopefully after you saw the previous slide, you're even more interested now. So here's the thing, we've only got an hour and 15 minutes if I don't get too excited and don't go over to talk about that. So we're gonna use Excel as the framework for a quick intro to our programming. But because of the time frame, I'm gonna gloss over a lot of stuff. I'm just gonna say, don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. Don't talk, you know, it's okay. Don't worry about that. And I'm also gonna illustrate some art of the possible. I'll have some fancier code towards the end of the demo. And I'll just kind of wave my hand and say, don't worry about this. You can learn more about that if you're interested on my YouTube channel. But I just want to show you what some of the art of the possible is. Some of the things, for example, you could do very easily in R that you cannot do in Excel out of the box at all. And here's the thing, and this is the most important thing. And, and believe it or not, I'm not being cliche. I, I, I really, 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 really believe this. My goal is to get you excited and confident about learning R. Confident that as an Excel user, you can learn R. It's not actually that difficult because you're gonna use R for very specific things and the things that you're gonna use it for are conceptually exactly the same as the things that you do in Excel. And you'll hear me say that over and over again. And then hopefully if I show you the art of the possible, you're gonna go, ooh, I want some of that too. And that's gonna get you excited to learn R. That's my goal. I'll let you be the judge by the end. Okay, so here's the prerequisites if you're gonna follow along. You're gonna need Excel, obviously. You're also gonna need the R programming language itself, and that is sufficient if you wanna just use the R command line. But I would also recommend that you get R Studio. I will be using R Studio, and essentially it's a graphical environment for doing R. It makes it a lot easier. It makes it a lot more um, productive if you're, not, if you're not familiar with using command line tools. And if you're gonna follow along, you're gonna need also these two R packages. So how many people here are familiar with the concept of Excel add-ins? Okay, almost everybody, right? You can think of these just as add-ins for R. You can reach across the internet, you can download it, install it in R, and it gives you additional functionality. Just like if you put the data analysis tool pack, for example, which is an add-in for Excel, all of a sudden you get a new thing on the ribbon, same idea. And as we saw earlier, there's a GitHub repo. The link is in the Meetup page. It's also in the deck. And you can get the source code, the data file, and the slides as well. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the data we're gonna use this evening. We're gonna use the Titanic training data set from the Kaggle website. If you don't know what Kaggle is, don't worry about it. It doesn't really matter. What's most important is, why would I pick to use this data set as an example? And the first answer is, everyone's familiar with the problem domain. So let's just double check that real quick. How many people here are not familiar with the Titanic and what happened? Awesome. Second, it's actually a good proxy for business data. 
As an example, it's a good proxy for customer profile data in a scenario like churn analysis, right? Where maybe I have an indicator variable in my Excel table that says, did this customer churn or not? And then the rest of the columns are the characteristics, the profile of my customers. How much they bought, how long they've been around, where they live, you know, all that kind of thing. So it's a good proxy for that. But most importantly, everyone's familiar with the problem domain. So here's the data in a nutshell. Since you're all data professionals, I figure you'd be interested in the data dictionary or the metadata or the glossary or the vocabulary, whatever term you use. So it's a very simple data set. So first and foremost, there's a column that tells you whether or not somebody survived or they perished. There's the class of the ticket. So your first, second, third class their gender, their sex, their age and years, and then two interesting demographic columns. This one I call SIBSPA, and that stands for the, the count, the number of siblings and or spouse, spouses, although technically no one was married to more than one person on the Titanic, but you get the idea. It's, it's the combination of, hey, how many people in my family was I traveling with? And they happen to be my siblings or my spouse. Next up is Parch, which is the number of parents and or children that I was traveling with aboard the Titanic. So this essentially is a demographic variable to tell you something about the family structure and the nature of the family breakdown. Ticket number, how much the, the, the passenger paid in pounds, obviously, because this is British, so British pounds. Their cabin number, which is interesting because not everyone on the Titanic actually had a cabin assigned to them. And where they got on the boat, the port of embarkation, Cherbourg, Queenstown, or Southampton. So as I said earlier, you can see, if you squint a little bit, you can see how this is a good proxy for customer profile data for things like churn analysis, right? Binary indicator, and then demographic information, profile information of the customer. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, I am a recovering Microsoft program manager. So because I worked there for eight years, it warped my brain. And I think of everything in terms of personas and scenarios. It's just the way I think about the world. So for the sake of this presentation, I'm going to do the same thing. We are data analysts. And in particular, we have asked to analyze the Titanic data set so that we can understand more about some of the underlying reasons why certain passengers survived and certain passengers did not. Typical data analysis task. Nothing fancy going on. Like I said, this has an analogy in business. Customer churn analytics, very popular, very important, spot on analogy to what we're doing right now. And here's the kicker. Throughout this presentation, I'm going to start in Excel. I'm going to start exactly how I would do analytics in Excel. Maybe your mileage will vary, maybe you won't do things exactly the same way I do, but hopefully you'll identify that everything that I do in Excel is probably something you do in your day job as an analyst. We'll go through the thought process, we'll do it in Excel, and then we'll see how you do exactly the same thing in R. And this is super important, I mentioned this earlier. The most important thing, the what, what do I do to analyze my data does not change. It's exactly the same. The only thing that changes is the how. And if you want to think of it in really gross terms, in Excel, I clicky, 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 and in R, I typey, typey, typey. Although you type in Excel too, obviously, formulas and that sort of thing. But you'll get the idea. So that's, that's the gist of it. Nothing fancy. Before I dive in, please don't hesitate to stop me and ask questions. OK. So first up, what we're going to do, oh, hold on, is I've got the files from the GitHub. And are you going to work, please? Sorry. Sorry for the AV problems here, folks. This is going to be problematic. There we go. Okay. 
So I've got the files from the GitHub here. And not surprisingly, I've got a CSV file, very common, right? An export from an, uh, another system, a data warehouse, who knows? So if I double click, whoops, if I double click it, as with most operating systems, including Mac, the operating system automatically associates .csv files with Excel and it just pops it open. Now here's the thing. I don't know about you, but here's the first thing that I do when I get a data, a data file like this. I turn it into a table. I turn it into a table. Here, and here's the reason why. Excel loves tables. Excel gives you lots of functionality when you have tables. Excel loves itself some tables. Guess what? R also loves tables. So that's the first conceptual similarity between the two. Actually, not even similarity, the same exactness between the two of them. Excel works on data in tables, whether that's a pivot table, a power pivot table, or just a regular old worksheet table. R is the same thing. It works on data in table format. And it gives you a lot of benefit. For example, notice the first thing here. Even though I didn't do anything, I just loaded up the data and put it into a table. R said, hey, this, this column E, labeled sex, the sex column, has, has text data in it, string data in it. And it's only got two values, male and female. Guess what? I'll let you go ahead and filter on those two categories automatically. Now, those of you, are, a lot of you are saying, duh, Dave, that's just the way Excel works. But you'll see that's actually pretty awesome. Not everything works that way. And R doesn't necessarily work that way exactly the same way, which is why I'm bringing it, bringing it up. But if you notice, I can do really cool things, right? I can just say, look, I don't want males and females. I only want the females. Now that I'm in a table and I've got a numeric column, I can filter on number ranges. Let's say I only want the females that are older than 16 years of age, so on and so forth. I get a lot of power. I get a lot of benefit out of the box with using Excel tables. So I don't know about you, but that's my default, right? I load up a data. If it's in CSV format, first thing I do, I slap it into a table. Now, here's another thing that I commonly do when I look at, when I'm analyzing data. I take a look at things that may not necessarily play real well with my intended audience. So the survived column here is a one and a zero. It's binary, right? One, the person lived. Zero, they did not. However, if I decide to create a chart and then I present that to some other folks that maybe aren't so necessarily analytically bent, I probably don't want my chart in terms of ones and zeros. It's probably not gonna look very good. It's probably gonna give me more questions than answers. What does the one mean, Dave? What does the zero mean, Dave? How should I think about this? So one thing that I do a lot is I say, okay, look, I want to make certain, I want to transform certain pieces of data in my table to make it more amenable to things like present, presenting it in chart format. So Excel makes that pretty easy. So I can add a column called survive label. And notice once again that Excel is super handy. It's super nice to me. It says, OK, Dave, you want to add a column to this table. I know what to do. I'll go, ahead, I'll go ahead and add it to the column, add the column to the table, and I'll auto-populate the add entire column all the way to the bottom of the table with blank data, empty data. But I know what you, I know what you want to do. You want to add data to this table. You haven't told me what you wanted in there yet, but I've, I assume that that's what you want to do. And sure enough, we can easily populate this with a formula. So for example, if I say if B2 is equal to one, maybe I want the text survived. Because now my charts will say survived instead of one. And that's probably a good thing depending on the audience that's looking at the chart. Otherwise, I want died. Now, all of you know what's going to happen when I hit the enter key, right? Magic. No, not the swirly ball of death. Okay, there you go. Magic. Once again, notice what Excel implicitly understood. Dave, you're putting a formula in the first blank cell 
of a column, so I'm going to auto-populate it all the way down. Right? This is super important. I know a lot of you are saying, Dave, why are you telling me the obvious here? We'll get there. We'll get there. So another thing that, we, that I do frequently, and I'm sure you do as well, is I enrich the, ta the table's data. I enrich the table data. So this is purely semantics, right? Or I shouldn't say semantics. This is purely you know, graphical sugar, right? To make my charts a little more interpretable than this. But I haven't really added anything to the data. I haven't enriched it so that I could do more powerful analysis. But that's something that we commonly do in Excel. So for example, I have variables that we, taught, that we saw earlier We have, I have variables earlier that talk about the family, the demographics of the family. How many siblings and spouses, how many parents and children. But what I don't have is any data actually talking about the family size in aggregate. Because here's an interesting analysis. How did family size potentially affect survivability on the Titanic? Maybe my hypothesis is, is that larger families didn't survive at the same rate because it was harder to get everybody together, get them through the ship, make sure they all got on uh, survival boats. So that's a hypothesis. The data currently doesn't allow me to do that very easily because the family size is actually scattered across multiple columns right now. So I can fix that. So I know that my family size starts with, with the individual passenger, right? Because these columns are the number and types of other people the passenger was traveling with. It's, it doesn't include the passenger themselves. So I have to start with a one. And then I can add to it the number of siblings and spouses I'm traveling with, and then the number of parents and children that I'm traveling with. And for some reason, my Excel is running exceedingly slow right now. But notice it auto-populates once again, right? Same thing. Now, these are two very common, yeah? I'm sorry, I'm just noticing that your survive label or your column mm -hmm. doesn't match your survive column. The first one is a one, and this one's a five, and the second Good point. So the code is correct. If B1 equals 1, survived, died. Wow, what's going on here, man? Oh, B2. Sorry, look at that. Thank you. No, and it's not B3, Dave. It is B2. Oh, that one's B3, sorry. And that one should be good. Thank you for pointing that out. Okay, now why is that not working? That's fine, let's do this. G1 plus H1. Oh, that's, that's wrong too. Wow. So my apologies, folks. There we go, okay. And just to make sure, we'll copy this all the way down just so that it's right. So imagine, if you will, you actually typed in your formulas correctly, unlike what I did. Wow, what is going on here? OK, you know what? I'll just do that again real quick. This time, I'll do it correctly. Yeah. Survived label, and that equals uh, if B two equals one, then survived. 
provide otherwise died. All right, that looks good. And then once again, family size, if you spell it correctly, one plus G2. Oh my goodness. Okay, there we go, all right. I was right with the world, my apologies on that. My bugs notwithstanding, the thought process is sound, trust me. Okay, now we can see here we have some quite a bit of variability, right? We have some sixes and some sevens and a lot of ones, that sort of thing. So that may be indicative of what's going on in the data. Now here's the thing, that thought process, right? The thought process of what I was doing there, fixing up the labels so that my charts look pretty, adding new features that enrich my data that allow me to do new and interesting analyses, exactly 100% the same, exactly 100% the same. You do exactly the same thing in R. The only difference, as I mentioned earlier, is the how. So let's take a look at R. And fortunately, all the R code is pre-coded, so no bugs, <laughs> no bugs. All right, so I double click on the R file and as with, as with Excel, the operating system has a linkage so it knows to open up our studio directly from the R file. And what we have here essentially is an embodiment of the same thought process that we just looked at in Excel, just implemented using R. So the first thing that we notice is that we wanna load up the Titanic data into what's known as an R data frame. An R data frame is just the same it's just the R specific terminology for a table. Anytime you hear the word data frame, just think in your mind's eye, an Excel worksheet table, you're in the right spot. Now here's the thing. In some ways, R is a little bit dumb. Well, compared to Excel, let's be honest, in a lot of ways, R can be, is a little bit dumb. So one of the things that we can do, one of the things we have to do, I should say in R, is we have to tell it, look, it's not smart enough to know where the data is that we wanna work with, so we have to tell it, here's the location where the data I want you to work with is on my hard drive. So that's actually pretty easy to do. So the first thing that we do is we go to the working directory, we go to the session, excuse me, set the working directory and choose the directory. This is how we tell R, look, on my hard drive, this is where the data is located. Now in my quick access, this is where it's located on my hard drive. So I just say, okay, select that folder. And you'll notice that it spits out a big long line of ugly code right down here. You could type this out by hand if you wanted to, but I mean, why would you? Use the GUI, it's just easier. Okay, now that we've primed R and we tell it, hey, this is where the data is located. This next line of code is actually gonna be super intuitive, I would argue, for you to look at, which is this right here. I mean, especially, look at this. Well, what's that? Titanic.csv, we know what that is. That's the file we wanna look at, right? That was the thing we double clicked in Excel and it opened up in Excel. We also intuitively understand what this means as well because we created a table in Excel and we said, yes, please, it has headers. Make sure you treat the first row as headers. That's exactly what this says too. There, there are headers in this CSV file. So that part, very easy to understand. So the only thing from R that's interesting is this right here. Now, Excel has lots of functions in it, hundreds of functions, hundreds of functions. One of the cool things about Excel is, is that it has a rich help system. You can look up all of these different kinds of functions in Excel and it provides you a nice help file. Good news is, is that R has the same capability. It has a built-in rich help system that you can use out of the box. The bad news is, is that while Excel has hundreds of functions, R has tens of thousands of functions total in the entire ecosystem. So good news is that you don't have to worry about all 10,000s of those all at once. You can just deal with a smaller subset, but you will be using the help system a lot in R, and it's really easy to use. In R Studio, you just come down here at the bottom, type in the question mark, and then type in the name of the function that you're interested in. So read.csv. 
And easily enough, you get the help file on read.csv. I won't drain this because you can look at it at your leisure. But as you might imagine, read CSV obviously reads a CSV file from disk and loads it up into R. Now the next thing in this piece of code that we should look at is this thing right here. This is the name that we want to give the data frame. This is the name that we want to give to a table. Now here's the thing. This concept is 100% analogous to Excel. Every table in Excel has a name. Usually it's implicit. Most people don't bother naming the table, so they usually default to table one, table two, table three on a per worksheet basis. But they all, they, all tables have names in Excel. And in fact, you can actually reference them in your formulas. I can be in one worksheet. I can type equal sign on a cell and then type in another worksheet name and then access the table by name and then select data out of it and put it in that worksheet. So the idea of a table name is integral in Excel. You may not use it a lot, but it's still there. In R, that same concept is actually super important. You deal with it all the time. My tables have names. My data frames have names. So what this line of code says is, R, please read this CSV file and assign it to a table with the name Titanic. And all this little arrow means is assignment. Or as I like to say, cram it into, because it's a very technical term. Take all that stuff on the right side, all that CSV data goodness, cram it into the thing called Titanic. So if we run this line of code, this is what we get. You can see up here in the, up here in the data section. I now have a table called Titanic. It's 891 observations of 12 variables. What that actually means is just think of it in this terms. That means 891 rows of 12 columns. So here's some synonyms for you in the R world. An observation is the same thing as a row. A variable is the same thing as a column, which is the same thing as a feature. And when you talk to people that do R, whether you're reading a blog post or watching a video, they'll often use these terms interchangeably. They'll use the term table, they'll use the term data frame, they'll use the term row, they'll use the term observation, they'll use the term column, variable, feature. Just know the mapping in your mind. Data frame, worksheet table. Observation, row. Feature or variable, column. And you're golden. It's all the same stuff. It's nothing complicated. Nothing complicated. And just to illustrate that, if you actually click on this in our studio, you actually get a spreadsheet view because it's exactly the same thing. It's a table of data. There's absolutely no difference. Okay. So, this should look pretty familiar to you as well. I mean, if you squint a little bit, it almost looks exactly like the formula code that we typed in in Excel. I mean, it's got a little bit added, added extra stuff, but conceptually, it's pretty close. Right? This part right here, the highlighted blue, that's exactly the same as the code that we typed in in Excel. That's pretty close. It's even got the same first two letters. But as usual, we'll go ahead and open this up in the help file. And it says, hey, if else is conditional element selection. In particular, if I run a test, and yes, the test is true, do this. Otherwise, no, do that. It's the same thing as the if function in Excel. Exactly the same thing. It's just called if in Excel, and it's just called if else in R. It's the only difference. Only difference. Now, what's a little hinky from an Excel perspective is this, this chunk of code right here, which is the test. It looks kind of like what we saw earlier when I typed it in correctly, B2 equals 1. But this is a little bit more. I had to type a little bit extra stuff in. But conceptually, it's basically the same thing. What this says is, R, please go to the Titanic table, access the Titanic table, <laughs> That's what the dollar sign means, access it. This is the equivalent of dot or the exclamation point in Excel. And go look at the survived column, the survived variable, the survived feature. 
and then check to see if it's equal to 1. If it's equal to 1, cool. That's what I'm interested in. Now, this is one of the things I'm just going to gloss over, like I mentioned earlier. In programming languages, you use equal equal for equivalent checks. Wonder why? It just is. Be sad and accept it just the way it is for right now. In R, it's just, or excuse me, in Excel, it's just one equal sign, and in R, it's two. But this says essentially what? Look, give me only, check to see if each individual value of survived, of the survived column, is equal to one. And if it is, then I want this value in the place. Others, I want died. And if I run that, and then I pull up the spreadsheet view, I get exactly what we saw in Excel. Now again, the what, the thought process of the data analyst between R and Excel, exactly the same. The only thing that's different is just a little bit different way of doing it. That's all. Yeah. Um, you had given it the, the assignment of going to survive global. If you had given it an assignment of going to, say, embarked, which you already have, would it have overwritten embarked, or would it have created a new column? Yeah. So what you're asking asking about, let me close this one down. You're asking about this part. I haven't got there yet. Yeah, I haven't got there yet. Thank you for reminding me. Yeah. Is our case sensitive? Yes. Very, very important question. I didn't want to bring that up because I didn't want to make too, people, too many people sad. But yes, R is case sensitive. R is case sensitive. So the question was about this right here. This is super important, and my apologies for not bringing this up earlier. We know what this does. We just went through that, right? Go through the survived column. Everywhere where it's one, the string survived. Everywhere where it's not one, give me the string died. But what do I do with that thing? You've done all that work for me, R. What do you want me to do? What do I want you to do with it? And with a highly technical term, right, we cram it into this thing called survive label. Now, this is how we interpret it. We say, R, please go to the Titanic table, access it using the dollar sign operator, and then I want you to go look at the survived label. Now, R is smart enough to know, wait a second, Dave, at that point in time, there was no column on the data frame, no column on the table called survive label. And it says, oh, I want, you want to add it. No problem. I will add a new column called survive label because it doesn't exist. So the question was, if I had actually put an existing column name there instead of one that was brand new, would, have, would it have overwritten the existing column with the values? And the answer is yes. It would have overwritten it. It would have overwritten it. Very good question. OK. Next up is the family size feature. Notice once again that conceptually it's not very different from Excel. Start with the Titanic table, access it. Please work with the column, the variable, the feature called family size. R says, Dave, there is no column called that on this. Table. You want me to add it for you. Okay, cool. What do you want to be stored in that brand new column? And that's everything to the right. Take the value one, add it to each value of SIBSPA and PARCH coming from the Titanic data frame. Notice that once again, this is conceptually exactly the same as Excel, right? If you squint, this almost looks kind of like what you'd Excel. Instead of it being G2 and H2, which is a little bit, you know, it's not as verbose, it's the same idea, right? I'm still accessing particular columns of the table and I'm adding them together. Same conceptual idea, same conceptual idea. Now, this line of code right here is just how you programmatically open the spreadsheet view. So if I run these two lines of code together, and I scroll over to the right, I get my family size column. Now, this, this, this probably doesn't seem like rocket science to you, but here, here's the dirty little secret of, of data science work in R. You spend an awful lot of time doing just this, working with tables manipulating data and tables an awful lot of time. Exactly the same way in analytics with Excel, you spend a lot of time working with tables. It's exactly the same thing. 
Okay. Now, you meant, if you remember earlier, you know, I talked about how Excel tables gave us a lot of really cool stuff out of the box, how it automatically recognized that the sex column only had two values in it, male and female, and it created a nice smart filter for us to filter based on male or female, how it recognized that the age column was numeric, and it gave us smart filters that said greater than or equal to or less than or equal to and all that. That's because behind the scenes, Excel takes a look at the data and tries to understand what kind of data it is and alter its behavior automatically. So sex, it said, look, you don't get greater than or less than filters because that's string data. That makes no sense. But you can get them on the age column because it understands that the data type, the kind of data in those columns, is different. Now, that's what makes Excel really, really nice. It's pretty smart. It actually infers a lot of stuff for you automatically. But as we all know, as Excel users, that's not the only way that data actually can be used in Excel. You can actually format your data. This column is currency. This column is date. This column is numeric. This column is actual text data. And when you do that, you're actually telling Excel more about what the data is supposed to be like, and therefore it changes its behavior based on that. You tell Excel the types of data that are in the in the in the table. Yeah. So the question is, if I format this in Excel and I read it into R, do I lose the formatting? And the answer is, as I'm fond of so fond of saying, as you well know, it depends. Because if you save this off as a CSV file, it, CSV files don't store that information, right? CSV files are relatively dumb. If you save this off as a .xlsx file, an Excel file, that is all preserved. If you read it into R, if you want to read an Excel file into R, you can do that. It's a lot more complicated. It's way beyond the scope of tonight's presentation. But if you do do that, yes, all of that formatting is preserved. But it makes it a lot more complicated. So. The short answer for tonight is no, the formatting does not persist because we're using CSV files and they don't store formatting. Now, this idea of data formatting, data typing, is super important in R. Like most programming languages, R isn't smart enough to just kind of roll with the data as you give it and just it just kind of infers things on its own. It wants to know exactly how to treat the data at all times, at all times. So if we actually look at this function here called str, this gives us a way to actually understand how does R think of our data right now. It says, display the structure of an arbitrary R object. When I apply it to a table, to a data frame, this function will tell me how is the data currently formatted? How does R see the cell formatting, essentially? Right? Is it currency? Is it numeric? Is it text? Is it this? Is it that? Is it the other thing? So this is super important in R. Well, it's super important in Excel too. I mean, how many of you here have ever worked with a, a, an ill-formatted Excel file before? Yeah, it sucks, doesn't it? I mean, it's terrible. So even in Excel, data formatting obviously makes a lot of, makes a lot of uh, importance. Okay, so when we ask R, hey, tell me what the data formatting is of this table, it provides us a lot of rich information. It says, first of all, Titanic's a data frame. 891 observations, 891 rows, 14 variables. Because we added two. It used to be 12, but now it's 14 because we added two new ones. And then it tells us by column, by variable, what's the current data format? Integers, integers. Now here's what's important. Notice when I get down to name, there's this thing called a factor. And factor is ours way of t telling you that I'm treating this thing as a category as a category. I'm explicitly understanding this to be a category. Now, what we see in Excel is exactly the same thing, but it's implicit. Because Excel is a little bit smarter than R, it just does this for you automatically. And let me demonstrate. If we go back to Excel, and I widen the name column a little bit, and I open up the filter, and I make the filter a little bit bigger, how many checkboxes do you think I have here? 891. 
because each one of these names is unique. So Excel automatically treats each one as a distinct category and allows you to filter on it. Same concept, exactly the same concept. By default, when you read in a CSV file in R, it interprets string values as categories, just like Excel does. And it creates for you automatically the, ca the appropriate categories. In this case, 891 unique values, just like the Excel filter for the name column gives you 891 distinct checkboxes that you can filter on. As you well know in Excel, that's not particularly useful because when are you gonna deal with 891 individual clicks? You're just not gonna do that, generally speaking. But it's how Excel works by default. R works exactly the same way. And you can see the other types here, factor, female and male, just like we saw in the Excel filter, so on and so forth. But I do wanna call out this one right here. Survive label. Notice we added that after the fact. When we loaded up the CSV file, R automatically looked at every string and said, look, I'm gonna make that a category by default. But we added that later on. And what R says is, okay, until you tell me otherwise, I'm gonna interpret that as text. CHR stands for character and R as an Excel user, just think of that as being formatted as text. I went to the cell formatting and I said, this is text data. Same idea. Now, here's another difference between R, which makes it a little more complicated in Excel. Excel is smart enough most of the time to treat text data as categories implicitly when it needs to. For example, in a pivot table, it will just do that automatically for you. You don't have to do anything. In R, it's a little bit more hit or miss. Depending on which function that you're using, some functions will say, hey, I'll automatically transform text data into categories for you, just like Excel does. But not all functions in R do that. So you have to be really, really careful. So generally speaking, when you're doing R programming, it's best to say, look, anytime I'm creating a category, change it to be a factor. And how you do that, beyond the scope of tonight, if you're interested, check out my YouTube videos. But notice once again the similarities, right? Of how they work. Excel and R, they work almost exactly the same in many, many circumstances. Okay, so let's say hypothetically speaking that I'm interested in analyzing male fares. I have a hypothesis about males on the Titanic and whether they lived or died based on how much they paid for their tickets, right? So it's a common hypothesis that you may, you may want to take a look at. So how would you do that in Excel? Well, you know, the default, at least for me anyway, is the mighty pivot table. Put in a pivot table, put in the sex filter. I say, hey, I'm only interested in the males. And I wanna get a high level intuition about fair. I wanna know something about it. So one of the things I may do, for example, is take a look at The min, maybe I took a look at the average. So on and so forth. Or right? I could put the standard deviation, I could put the max, I could put a bunch of stuff up there. All the stuff the pivot tables give me out of the box. And that can give me a general indication. Okay, look, wow, some men paid zero for their fare. That's probably interesting from an analytical perspective. Why, why are some people paying nothing for their ticket? Are they employees traveling on the boat or something? I, I don't know, we'll have to figure that out. But you'll notice that the average fare is 25. That could be potentially interesting, but without more summary statistics, it's kind of hard to understand. Now the problem with pivot tables is, at least out of the box, they're actually quite limited in what they can do. So Excel actually provides you a better option, which is what's known as the data analysis tool pack. How many people here are familiar with the data analysis tool pack? A few. So if you, want to, if you want to activate the data analysis tool pack, this is how you can do it. You go to File, you go to Options, you click on Add-ins. Uh-oh, okay. Click on Add-ins, click on Go, and you'll see I already have mine activated. But by default, I believe this is actually turned off. So you have to actually go in and turn it on. 
And the data analysis tool pack actually gives you access to a lot of good stuff from an analytical perspective. One of the things it allows you to do is create rich summary statistics over numeric data. But here's the problem. If I only wanted to get rich summary statistics over the male fares, if I just go into the table here and filter on females, it doesn't work. Because like most Excel functions, it's not smart enough to realize that the hidden rows should be exempted from the calculations. Right? Let me just show you this real quick, right? So if I only look at the males, this works okay. But if I actually use the data analysis tool pack, it's not smart enough to actually discard the rows, the female rows, which are implicitly hidden right now. So one technique to make that work is I create a brand new table. So I've got my filtered male data. I just copy it, paste it in to a new worksheet, make it a table. And now I've just got male data. No hidden female rows, it's just the male data. It's, it's pristine, it's, it's pure. And now I can use the analysis tool pack to create some rich summary statistics. So I go to the data tab in the ribbon, and you'll notice that when you activate the data analysis tool pack, you get this cool new feature right here. So if I click that, I get a whole bunch of awesomeness. Too much to go into, obviously. What we care about right here is descriptive statistics. So we say, okay. And we say, what's the input range? It's right here. I want these, these values. And I want you to create summary statistics and go ahead and put it, I'll put it on my current worksheet and just spit it out right here. Now what this does, it gives me a lot of rich statistics. This is, this is richer than I can get out of the box with the pivot table. Right? And it gives, me a much, it gives me a much better intuition about what's going on with male fares. For example, the average is 25 and a half pounds. That's what the average price of the male ticket is. But notice that the median value is only 10 and a half. So what that tells me is, is that we got skew. There is a few people that paid a lot, a few males that paid a lot for their tickets. Most people paid probably quite a bit less. Because if the, the mean is 25 and the median is only 10 and a half, there's going to be something going on. I don't know exactly what yet, but I know there's probably something going on there related to fair. I couldn't get this with an out-of-the-box pivot table. It doesn't do median calculations, for example. And you can see the range. That's a big one. Some guy paid 512 pounds for his ticket. 512 pounds. Skewness number is five. Hmm? That skewness number is five. The skew, yeah, so, well, over yeah. So I'm kind of skipping over kurtosis and skewness because they're kind of advanced topics and kind of sticking with the basics, but yes, you're absolutely right. If you just look at the range, the median, and the mean, that tells you a lot. It tells you there's skew in this data. Skew in this data. Now let's see how we could do exactly the same process in R. Because, once again, and I'm going to beat this dead horse, the what. The what of the data analysis process between R and Excel, exactly the same. It's only the how that differs. Only the how. So not surprisingly, we're going to ask R to go to our Titanic data frame here. And notice that I don't have a dollar sign here. Remember before we said the dollar sign was access the table, please? The dollar sign, or excuse me, the square bracket means filter the table, please. That's the syntax for applying a filter. Now, the first thing that you need to know about R is that you can apply both row filters and column filters at the same time. And that's what this comma is for. Everything before the comma is a row filter. And everything after the comma is a column filter. So what this says is, hey, R, I would like you to filter the Titanic table. Since there's nothing after the comma, I want all the columns. I'm not filtering any of the columns at all. Just give me all the columns. But I would like to filter the rows. 
And in particular, what I'd like you to do is use a filter by going to the Titanic data frame, accessing it, grabbing the sex column, and checking to see if it's equal to male. If it is, I want it. This gives me the males. And if you think about it, this is exactly the same in a worksheet table in Excel, going to the filter on the sex column, opening it up, and unclicking the female so that only the male is clicked. And that gets rid of all the females and leaves you only the males. Same idea. Conceptually the same thing. And then lastly, please cram in all those rows that I just filtered down to only the males into a table called males. And sure enough, 577 observations. And to just to double check, we can go back to Excel and notice that the count here is also 577. So they match up. Conceptually, same thing. Now here's where R really, really shines. Now, not surprisingly, as a programming language built by statisticians for statisticians, every statistic that you can think of in the world has an implementation in R. Everything. And stuff you've never heard of and probably will never care about. All available. Anything you can do. This is going to be an underlying theme going, on, going forward in the rest of the presentation. If you learn how to use R, you are unconstrained. You are unconstrained in your data analysis. Because any, any data set, any data file, any collection of data that will fit into Excel will easily fit into R and you can do anything with it because you have access to, I said, tens of thousands of functions to do anything you can think of, any kind of visualization you can think of, any kind of mathematical calculation, machine learning, anything, clustering, you name it. So that's why it's super awesome for an Excel analyst. You already know a lot of the basics because you do Excel and analytical work already. All you need to do is just learn how to do it in R, and then the whole universe opens up to you. You are unconstrained in your work. Yeah. Good question. Does R support, uh, Question. Does R support JSON? The answer is yes. Can I read in Excel files? Can I read in JSON files? Can I read in XML files? Can I read in HTML files? Can I read in blah files? The answer is yes. Because this that's the power of R. Because basically, generally speaking, anything that you need somebody else needed before you, and someone created a package with functions to allow you to do it. Yeah, seriously. I mean, Google's your friend. You just type in R, blah, and you get back a bunch of articles and Stack Overflow posts and all kinds of things about how to do exactly what you want to do. It's awesome. So I'll just run all this code. And you can see here, what I get is a lot of summary statistics. I won't drain the individual functions. You could, of course, use question mark summary, question mark SD. But the summary function creates some nice summary statistics for us. The minimum, the maximum, the median, the mean, the first quartile, the third quartile. This is the variance. This is the standard deviation. This is the total of all the fares. And this is the number of fares that they were. Notice how, once again, this conceptually aligns to the summary statistics output that we got from the data analysis tool pack. But I would argue this is actually easier and faster and more intuitive than actually using the data analysis tool pack. Yeah. Well, but would you mind not maximizing your window? It's cutting off the left column the way your vectors line up with your screen. Thank you. No problem. So, summary statistics. And then, of course, anything that you can dream of that Excel doesn't have, ours, ours got it. Yeah. You mentioned that the R can create a lot of file formats, but all of them are sound like well formatted data. So, how about the data which is not well formatted, like the log files that are going to be bad in all the applications? Yeah. So, the question is data, Dave, everything you talked about is a structured file. What about something like a log file? Now, log files are also structured because they have to be read by something. Yeah. Yeah. So as long as you can find some way to apply structure to the file, which you would have to, you're not going to be able to work with a log file if you can't apply some sort of structure to it. 
right? Even if you say this column or this chunk of the data in the log file is freeform text and it's unstructured, you at least there is some structure. R can read it just like anything else. It's a programming language, so it can read anything just like that. And it, it can actually even work with truly unstructured data as well, like images. Because images are by definition structured, otherwise you wouldn't be able to get it off of your phone onto your computer. So the files themselves have structure. The binary content, the pixels in the image, that's unstructured. You can even work with that in R2. So yeah, it works with everything. Good question. If you have varying number of columns in different rows, like arrays. If you have varying columns across rows, so most programming languages are going to have a problem with that. So you have to have some way of actually identifying that. I mean, in JSON, you, you might actually have an array. Oh, yeah. So JSON is a different story, right? So JSON is actually semi-structured. Excel, uh, not Excel, HTML is semi-structured. R works with that because, yes, even though it's, even though it's semi-structured, it still has to hold to some rules, right? Well-formatted JSON has a format. And therefore, you can interpret it at runtime because it has a format. And there are R packages that allow you to work with JSON. Good question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the answer is, Dave, OK, look. This, that's not even an Excel scenario, by the way, just, it's, so, just so you know. It's a little unfair, by the way, for this presentation. But I'll answer it anyway, because as you well know, I'm an R aficionado. The answer is yes. You can read in files line by line. There are even packages that you can get that will actually stream data from disk if necessary. And you can actually say, look, this file is huge. I want you to do a calculation on it. And it will say, okay, look, I will only load up so much in memory, flush the stuff that I just read, read some more in, continue the calculation, so on and so forth. In fact, Microsoft actually bought a company called Revolution Analytics which actually has a really awesome capability for doing exactly that. Yeah. I'm sorry, you split length. Length. So that essentially says how long is that variable? How long is that column? How many how many cells are in it? And there are 577 cells. Yeah. Yes. Floodgates are. Oh no, that's not a question. Oh. Oh yeah. Uh, the, I'm running 3.32, so this one's a little bit behind. So the latest version of R is, I think, 3.3.3 3 .3 right now. So this one's a little bit behind, but not, not a lot. Yeah? Ah. Yeah, so the question is, Dave, why is this blue? Why is this blue? That's just color coding. That's a common thing that you see in programming languages and the tools that you use for programming languages. Certain keywords, certain things that are important to the actual programming language. Not the stuff you make up yourself as the programmer, but stuff that the, the, the language is. Typically has a different color. So true is a constant. It comes with the language. It's not something I, I make up myself as the programmer. It comes with the language. And for as another example, You'll see here one is blue because because it's the number one. I don't make that up as a programmer. And you'll see here this is also blue because that's a number range. Good question. And an excellent segue, by the way. Thank you. Because that's the next line of code. All right. So what does the colon do in Excel? Slice. Range, range of cells. If I tell you A1 colon A7, as Excel users, you know automatically what I'm talking about. In your mind's eye, you see the top left of a worksheet. And I'm highlighting A1, A2, A3, A4, A5, A6, A7, or I'm selecting those cells. It's a range. Guess what? Exactly the same thing in R. If I even run this line of code, One, two, three, four, five. Ranges work exactly the same. Excel just has this, this, this syntax where you use A1, you know, 
all that sort of thing. You have A, you have the columns specifically lettered, with, you know, using letters for the columns. In R, columns are just numbers. It's just one, two, three, all the way, you know, unlike in Excel where it's A through Z, and then it's AA through ZZ, and so on and so forth. But no, they're just numbers, which actually makes things a little bit easier because, you know, when you're dealing with 333 columns in an Excel table, who knows what the actual letter combination for the 333rd column is? I don't. Do you? Right? But they're just numbers in R, so they're easier to work with. So, we know implicitly what we're doing here already, right? We're going to the Titanic data frame and we're asking to filter it. And specifically, we're saying, hey, I want the first five rows because one through five, the range one through five, is before the column. And there's nothing after, excuse me, before the comma, before the comma, and there's nothing after the comma. So give me the first five rows, give me all the columns. And then please store that into a new table called first five, first dot five. If I run that line of code, sure enough, I get five observations of 14 variables. Now this is just kind of, I mean, arguably this is kind of silly, but I just want to demonstrate how we can also do a column filter. Go to this table, filter it please. I want all the rows because there's nothing here, but I only want the first five columns. I only want the first five columns. There you go. All right. So in some ways, certain things are easier. For example, slicing and dicing data is actually easier in R than it is in Excel, especially programmatically. Yeah. Sorry, say it one more time. The dot? Oh, Dave, why is it first dot five? What is this craziness? That's purely Dave's preference. So. Unfortunately, one of the things, when you get into R, you'll, be, you'll start to become programmers. And one of the unfortunate things that programmers get super religious about is coding style and convention. So some folks would say, Dave, name that thing the right way with a dot. Other people would say, blasphemy, that should be an underscore or something else. So in the R community, for example, a common, a common thing that people do is they go look at Google's coding style and they say, that's the style that we follow. I'm not so I'm not so beholden to Google, so I just kind of do do what I like. So that's the reason why it's a dot. So did you want to? So I just want to make sure I understand the question. Are you asking now that I have first five, can I add just the column values there? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question is, can we only add the new column from males? And the answer is no. Think of it in Excel. In a worksheet table, I can't add a column just for the males in, in, in Excel either, right? The best I could do is on the female rows, they would, the values would be blank, right? That, that you can do in R2. But you can't just say, look, this column is only for the 577 males, and that column doesn't exist for the females, because they're all part of the same table. And that works just like Excel. You can't do, you can't do that in Excel either. But we, made the new table males. we did make the new table called males, but that wasn't her question. Her question, if I understood it, her question was on the original table. Was it, am I correct on that? Yeah. Okay. If we add the new columns, will that be updated in the CSV? Very good question. And the answer is no. And here's the way to think about it. I can change that CSV file all I want in Excel until I hit Control S. It doesn't get saved back to disk. Same thing in R. You have to explicitly save the changes using some code, right? There's a function called write.csv, right? Read, write. That would essentially save it back to disk. So just like in Excel, you have to save it. Yeah. Good question. Yes, exactly. So think of it this way. When I double click on a CSV on Windows, it automatically loads up into Excel's memory. But until I save it, the change that I make is not permanent yet. 
same thing in R. It's not permanent until I save it back to disk, just like in Excel. Just like in Excel. Okay. So now let's go back. We created this family size column, right? We created this family size column. And we thought we could do some interesting analyses with it. So as an Excel user, what's the first thing we're going to do? I'm going to put in a pivot table, right? Because that's what you do in Excel. You put in a table. So let's go back to our pivot table. And I'm going to change this up a little bit. I don't care about frame anymore, so I'll get rid of that. And let's say I'm, at, I'm particularly interested in analyzing family size by the combination of gender, by sex, and by P class. Right? That's the power of the pivot table, right? Drill down. Yeah. Okay. So we can go ahead and put P class. Oops. Put P class in there. And I'm also interested in survivability, right? I'm interested in analyzing things in terms of survived and died. So one way I could do that is to make this the column. So now I'm analyzing females by class, males by class, by died and survived. And what I'm interested in looking at is family size. Now that's not particularly useful from an analytical perspective. It's just basically a big table of numbers. What does it mean? I don't know. So one thing we may do is we may say, look, you know what? Let's make that the average, actually. And I'm getting there. I mean, it's still a table of numbers, but you know, Excel's pretty cool. I can insert this thing called a pivot chart. Now we're, now we're talking about something. Now we're talking about something. I can see blue has died, and of course I could change that. I could go into the, and configure the chart, but just, just roll me here that blue has died and orange has survived. And we can see, based on the averages, that, wow, if you're a female and your family size is bigger on average, your chances of survival seem to be worse. Smaller average family sizes seem to indicate better chance of survival. Right? Notice the difference in the bars. Males in second class, it's the opposite. Oddly enough, you survived if you had a bigger family in general. This is what it's saying. Kind of, sort of. Because here's the problem. This is just averages. What I, really, what I would really, really want to know, essentially, is given a distribution of family size, right? The distribution of family size for females in first, second, and third class. The distribution of family size for males in first, second, and third class. What is the proportion of survived versus died in those distributions? That would be more important, because this is just averages, right? All I can say to somebody with this chart is, well, females in third class had an average family size of three and a half, and it appears that they perished a little bit more frequently than those that had an average family size of two. Not super useful, actually, analytically. OK, no problem. Cool, cool, cool. So we go back to Excel, and we say, OK, cool, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and get rid of that. I want to do a pivot chart. I want something that shows me the distribution of the numbers. I want a histogram, because that's what shows me the distribution of data. Wah, wah, wah. No dice. Excel cannot do this. It cannot do this with a pivot chart. It cannot do this with the data analysis tool pack. It cannot do this out of the box. It doesn't do it. It will not allow me to drill down and say, by gender and by class, what is the survivability rates as it varies across family size? Because my hypothesis is, remember, I think that larger families probably didn't survive as much as smaller families. I have no way of answering this question easily in Excel. Now some of you are thinking, Dave, not to worry. I have the mighty Tableau. I have Power BI. I have Spotfire. Yes, you could do that in those tools, but they're not as cool as R. You know this to be true. You know, it's, you know it empirically to be true. It is not, they're not as cool as R. 
And the reason for that is, once again, those tools are great. Tableau is great, Power BI is great, and they do a lot of cool and interesting things. But once again, you are eventually constrained by those tools. And in R, you are not constrained. You can do whatever you want. For example, you can use a package, the R version of an add-in, called ggplot2. ggplot2 is quite possibly the most single awesome data visualization in the history of the planet. And even though I'm biased, I think a lot of people would agree with me on that. So if we run this line of code, let me prove it to you. Here we have an awesome plot. Across the top, females. Across the bottom, males. First class, second class, third class. Orange is dyed. This turquoise color is survived. Oh. There's a whole lot of information right there. Whole lot of information. First thing you notice is, oh, for the gentleman's request, my apologies. First thing you notice, if you're a female in first or second class, it kind of doesn't matter what your family size is. It's, it's good. It's good to be a female in first or second class in the Titanic. Look at that. I mean, very few perished. Not so much for dudes in third class. It's, it's pretty much sadness. But a couple things that, do, that are interesting is that you'll notice that starting about here for females in third class, and for males in third class, it's overwhelmingly orange dyed. So it does seem to support the hypothesis in, with a modification. Yeah, family, larger family size seems to in, give you a, a poor indication of survivability, mainly in third class. Mainly in third class. Not so much for females in first and second, and not really for males in first and second class either. This kind of visualization, you cannot do out of the box in R. Or excuse me, in Excel. <laughs> you, you can do it out of the box in R. But here's the thing. Some folks say, look, Dave, this is, this is super, this is a lot of typing. This is a lot of typing. Why would I want to do this? This is a lot of typing, right? It's easier for me just to click around in Excel and create a chart. Well, here's the thing. You're actually super wildly productive because Look how easy it is for me to create a new chart. Less than 10 seconds, and now I'm looking at fair. And this one has this one has a lot of value in it too. First and foremost, Good Lord, it's small. What does that tell you? It tells you there's a lot of skew. I mean, look at that. The reason why it's small is because of this big, long line right here. And notice, although it's a little hard to tell, if you had it on your computer, you would see that it's the vast majority of it's orange. So it tells you a lot, right? There's skew in the fares, right? We know this already, right? We knew by looking at it earlier that the range was really high, 512. We knew the medium was only 10 and a half for males, for example. And now you know why. Look at that. Right? And then look at this guy right here. It's like Bill Gates right there. Look at that. Oh, yeah, he's green. Oh, yeah, he's green. He's, he's, he's teal. Oh, you know, Bill Gates got off. It's all right. He's all good. Right? So even this tells you a lot. Just, just, just by the shock and awe of how small and tiny everything is, it tells you a lot already. Right? And it, only, it took less than 10 seconds to create this plot. This, I would argue, this takes less time than clicking around in Excel to create a chart. Not to mention that you can't even create this chart in Excel. Oh, and I would also tell you, by the way, it's actually faster than using Power BI, too. Because I use Power BI. And I've timed it. Trust me. I've timed it. It's faster. So that's some more of the possible. But wait, there's more. I've got more. Using another package, another add-in called dplyr, 
you can actually create your own pivots. So for example, if I run this code, I can now create a pivot by P class, first, second, third, drill down by sex, drill down by labels, average family size, passenger counts. If you squint a little bit, this looks exactly like what you would get out of a pivot table in Excel, right? But here's the thing, once again, I am unconstrained. Any mathematical calculation that I want, I can put in this pivot table. Any one, any of them. I'm unconstrained. For example, if I want median to be added, let's say I want the median of fare to be added. It's just that simple. I'm unconstrained. I can add any mathematical calculation I want. The data analysis tool pack gives me a lot, but data analysis tool pack doesn't have everything in it. Guess what? It, guess what does have everything in it? R's got everything in it. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay, so that's some more out of the possible. Right? You can create pivots. You can create beautiful visualizations quickly and easily. Stuff you can't do in out of the box of Excel. Stuff, quite frankly, that you can't do in tools like Power BI and Tableau, and if you're interested, we actually have a, f a recorded meetup that actually demonstrates some R visualizations that you cannot do in Power BI. So we put them in Power BI using the R integration. So if you're interested in that, we have that up on our channel as well. But there you have it. There you have it. Okay, come on now. Okay, there we go. Questions? Can you pull from two sources and join them? Can you pull from two sources and join them? The answer is yes. So if, if anybody here, how many people here are familiar with like working with relational databases at least a little bit? So you can actually simulate anything that you do in a relational database, you can simulate in R. With the caveat that it all has to fit in memory. It all has to fit in memory on the computer. But yeah, you can load up one table like this, one table like that, and you can join them together as long as they have, they have like pieces of data that line up, you can join them. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let me ask you, let me ask you guys a question. How many people are interested in learning more about R after this? Yes. Yes. How many people here think it's not as hard as they thought it might be? It's not as hard as you, as you might not think. Because here's the thing, most, most of the stuff that you use, there's a whole bunch of R that you'll never use as an analyst, because you don't need it. All that crummy computer science stuff, don't worry about it. Just use the stuff that, that works with the analysis, right? It's a lot easier. Yeah. Figured out, so what do you mean? So the question, the question, oh, automatically clean all your data for you? Why would you want that? So the question is, Dave, is there a magical R package that totally destroys my job security? Thank God the answer is no. It does not destroy your job security. The answer, oh man, someone's always got to be a negative Nelly on this whole thing, man. Yes, so the, the current answer is there are a lot of packages, there are packages that can help. There are specific packages that do automate a lot of standard data cleaning and data transformations. However, is it going to work in your specific scenario with your specific data set? It depends. It depends. And I would argue that's a good thing because of job security, right? I'm a computer scientist by training. I'm a programmer. In a very real way, most of my career, was to put people out of work and get computers to do it for them. I'm a data scientist now. I don't want that to happen to me. So it, it's possible that it will happen at some point, but not right now, not at this stage. Yeah. Dave, can you give some examples of where R is being used at scale, at really large scale, some more, or some really more interesting projects? Ooh, yeah. 
So me personally are at scale. So when you say at scale, what do you mean? Yeah, sorry to be pedantic. When you say a really large data set, what do you mean? Because one person's really large data set is another person's not very large data set. So I'm talking, I'm talking exabytes. Exabytes? <laughs> uh, uh, I don't, me personally, I don't know of anybody at exabyte scale. And if you're really talking about exabyte scale, more than likely you're talking about some sort of custom solution Anyway, right? I mean, even, even Hadoop itself, I think, probably would start choking on multiple exabytes. Yeah, that's what I'm asking. I'm trying to get a sense for where, where it gets up to, where, where do you need additional things to work with it, or where this is just part of the wire. So let me ask, do you work at Google? No. Do you have an exabyte problem? I don't personally, yeah. but I may work with customers. Yeah. If you, work with cus if, you have, if you have customers that have exabyte problems, more than likely, you're going to have a hard time finding off-the-shelf solutions of anything that's going to work at that, right? Yeah. Yeah, and again, I was trying yeah. to ask just to get a gauge for yeah. what's, the, what's the scale of which are you there? Yeah, so for example, um, I'll give you an example. You can go to Microsoft's cloud. I'm obviously, obviously, I'm familiar with this because I used to work there. You can go to Microsoft's cloud. You can spin up a Hadoop cluster in the cloud it's called HD Insight. And you can actually provision a, um, a Spark cluster on top of that Hadoop cluster, and they will actually run algorithms in parallel using R because of the, the aforementioned purchase of Revolution Analytics I talked about, and push that down across all the nodes in the cluster. So you can easily talk about terabytes, hundreds of terabytes of data doing that. Now, what I have, what I showed in my laptop, I got 16 gigs of RAM in that laptop, so that's that's not going to work. That's not going to work. But I can hook that up to a cluster in the cloud. Write my code right here. Hit enter. It gets pushed to the cloud. It gets distributed and works a bunch of data. It aggregates the results and brings it back to me. So that's absolutely done. But if you're talking about exabytes, I mean, I mean, to be honest with you, there's not many companies in the world that really have an exabyte problem. Not really. Yeah, so, the, so if I may interpret your question, Dave, I'm not a statistician. Can I still use R productively? And my answer would be, if you're not a statistician and you're using Excel productively, the answer is yes. Right? Because there are plenty of statistical functions in Excel. There's lots of them. doesn't mean everyone, I mean, most people don't use them. Right tool for the right job. Right? There's, you can do actually pretty sophisticated statistical analysis in Excel if you want. Not many people do because they don't, it's not necessary. Same thing in R. Just because all that power is there doesn't mean you have to use it. I'm sorry, say it one more time. Using R? Yes. It depends. It depends on the problem. <laughs> Yeah, so first thing that you would do is you would say, this is my problem domain. I would go, you would go to what's known as CRAN, which is the internet repository for all of the packages, all of the add-ins for R, and you would find what's known as a task view. And what you'd look for is the financial task view. And you would say, which packages are available that fit my problem domain? Unless you're, co unless you're coding all the calculations from scratch. Yeah, or are you, are you trying to build a machine learning model? You feeling me? I'll feel it. All right. I'm not sure how to automate it because I need yeah. to automate it from there to sell a subscription. So let me give you an, let me give you a specific example. There is a so the boot camps that I teach working for Data Science Dojo, there are a collection of students that are currently working on a very similar type of financial problem around currencies, using R as their platform. 
And they found a bunch of packages out, out of the box that work for them. So what kind of project is it? Is that one Wall Street? Is that well, I can't, is it? you can't talk too much about it. Right? If, if you're in finance, you know. Right? Secret sauce. You can't talk too much about it. I'll only bring that up as an example of what, what's possible. Now, again, given the specific nature of your problem, because I'm not a finance guy, I'm not a banking financial person, so you'd have to go look and see what's available. My guess is there's probably some stuff that'll work for you. Now, spinning that up as a production data product, a bunch of different options. One easy way to do that is to look at what's known as Azure ML, Azure Machine Learning. It has the ability to essentially um, run our code and our models in the Azure cloud and quickly turn them into REST web services, that can be called. And then, and then you, for example, you could sell your API to people, for example, calls to your API. Any other questions? Or it depends. It depends. Yeah. Um, is our able to work with uh, a messaging service like Kafka, for example, to consume messages? I'm sure we'll, we'll write packages, but is it able to ingest data in a sort of cleaning manner where you wouldn't really need some computation to spit out data? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so the question is, Dave, I've got streaming data, most prototypically yeah, exemplified by I have a Kafka bus or I've got Kinesis in AWS or I've got an event hub in, in uh, Azure. Can R read from those? And the answer is yes. With the caveat, hopefully, is that someone's already written a package for you to use. Now, if you have to, you can write it yourself. For example, it's actually not that difficult to write up a Java jar and then wrap it in R package and then you can call it from R for example. And basically, if you can get access to Java, you can basically get access to just about anything. Kafka, for example, because it's written in Java. So. Good question. Yes? Oh. It's a good question. Dave, this is a programming language, and I'm not a computer scientist. How difficult is it? Remember that the people who originally built R weren't computer scientists either. They were statisticians. So the answer is you don't need a computer science background, right? Because it's not a general purpose programming language. For example, there's no heavy duty constructs in R like pointers. And if you don't know what a pointer is, don't worry about it. Just, just know that it's something terrible. You don't want it. <laughs> it's terrible. You don't want it. And R doesn't have them. So you don't have to worry about it. So it's not, it's, it's not that difficult. Because again, it, it was built by statisticians for statisticians. It wasn't built for computer scientists for computer scientists, which is why a lot of computer scientists thumb their nose at it. Because they're like, where are your pointers? Oh, no pointers. So, but it will take effort. I mean, don't get me wrong. It will take effort. But you should not feel intimidated by it because you don't have a computer science background. Is there any prerequisite to do before doing this? I, if you're asking me, I would say no. And in fact, I believe it so much that I, like I said earlier, I've put quite a few hours in building a tutorial on my YouTube channel to teach our programming to people using the Excel-based thing that we just saw here, right? You do this in Excel, this is how it looks in R. You do this in Excel, this is how it looks in R. And then eventually, we, the, the, the tutorial just goes to say, okay, look, we're leaving Excel now, but by that point, you're pretty comfortable with R and say, look, here's some R-specific stuff. So I would argue, no. Okay, so I'm not familiar with Prism, to be honest with you. I have coded in MATLAB. I coded it in my, during my master's degree. Um, the single basic, biggest advantage that R has over MATLAB is that R is free. And never discount the power of free. Not only to mention the fact is that um, MATLAB as well as SAS also suffer from the same problem. They don't innovate nearly as fast. Right? There is a worldwide advanced research community that builds stuff in R. So it's constantly growing, constantly getting new stuff. Same thing with Python, by the way, right? which is also open source and free. So that's the primary, those are the two primary advantages over MATLAB and, and, and SAS, for example. Is there a single repository? The answer is yes, it's called the interwebs. 
and it's called Google Scholar. So the answer, the answer to your question is no. There's, you're talking about academic research of like, I say, a way that oh, I know, I want, I, I want, no, you want finance. I know what you're talking. Yeah, look at you try to deflect with the image process, and come on now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm with you. Integration. Mm-hmm. You can buy the book, but he has a PDF on his website, and it walks you through. So he gave this book of books for people that were not sufficient yep. to learn R and introduce them to machine learning. Machine learning. So it's free. You can download yeah. this book for free. And, and it's really good because it gives you good examples and the storytelling behind. So after you do your analysis, then you go about mm -hmm. telling the story. So that's actually a really excellent point, and it actually dovetails with your question. It's called Introduction to Statistical Learning. Yeah, ISL, HASTI, H-A-S-T-I-E. That's one of the authors. But this is actually dovetails with your question, which is, is there one single repository for all academic research in a particular area? The answer is no. Google Scholar helps a lot with that. But what's actually interesting is, is exactly what this lady brought up, which is if you, there are actually a ton of books on a wide range of subjects about R. To be honest with you, it wouldn't surprise me if you went to Amazon and did a search that you may, not, you may find a book closely related to the, your subject matter where they used R as the language to talk about it. So for example, uh, you can find books that are specific to R for like financial time series forecasting. That's all they talk about, how you do that in R. Right, so you may find a book that's R based on that subject. It revolves around cash flow and then uh, making decisions. Yeah. Like, should I buy plant A in California or should I plant, buy plant B in San Francisco or something like that? Yeah. So for ex so um, yeah. So you you may want to check on Amazon. It, there may be some someone may have brought a book that's in that space. It's possible. I'm not saying it's happened, but it's possible because there's so many books written about these various topics, and they all use R because it's open source, it's free, and there's lots of packages. Yeah? Uh, maybe it's a, not a related uh, thing, two things, like R and scope. Scope is scope. scope. Oh, man. Oh, I know what scope is. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you know that. Yeah. I guess my question is, like, why not use R if it can query that script without that and like, seems like so you're asking why Microsoft built Scope? Yep. Well, that's a really good question. I've been wondering, or in, in Cosmos for that matter, <laughs> right? In a word, probably Balmer, I would imagine, because when Cosmos was originally built, um, Hadoop existed at the time. Yeah, I thought it was a repository for all the Bing data. It is, but the, the question is, why would Microsoft build a custom proprietary big data store when Hadoop already existed and open source tools already existed? And the answer was, at a certain point in time, that wasn't allowed at Microsoft. It was what's known as competitive technology. So it wasn't allowed. It's entirely different now. Satya, genius, it's a totally different company now as far as that stuff goes. But when Cosmos was originally built, yeah, there was a different kind of company, different kind of culture. Yeah. Now, that's one man's opinion, by the way. Uh, don't take that as gospel. That's one small little cog in a big machine's opinion. <laughs> also, I think it's important to just recognize that uh, there are certain things that you can do in R that Excel is totally useless for. So, for example, if you're going to try and build a model, uh, let's say something in stochastic gradient descent, uh, you have yeah. to test the model, you have to train it, and there's functions you can do in R to do this, but Excel will not help you. Well, so so you so you can implement stochastic gradient descent in Excel, and if you don't know what stochastic gradient descent is, it's just really complicated math, basically. You can do it in Excel. You can actually implement neural networks in Excel if you really really want to. I don't know why you would, right? But you can as long as you're willing to wait for it to process, for Excel to do all the calculations, and two, your data is small enough that it will all fit inside of the Excel. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm not saying do it. <laughs> I'm not saying do it. But is it possible? Yes. But here's the thing, right? And this this is a fundamental truth, I would argue, of just about anything. In the, in, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do something. And typically what determines whether you should do it or not is cost. If, if you could implement stochastic gradient descent in Excel, it would probably take you so long to do it that it doesn't make any sense for you to do it. Just use an R function or Python scikit-learn or something like that. Right? It's a cost. It's a cost problem. Yeah. How would you use R on the server side of the path? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So the question is, hey, this seems like Dave. The impression I get is this seems to be a client-side technology, right? It was built for statisticians working on their local computers. It's not a enterprise class server system. And the answer is, that is true. However, companies like RStudio and Microsoft have now transformed that. So Microsoft sells something called RServer now, which actually provides you a server-side solution. If you're lucky enough to have SQL Server 2016, you can have R services, which is pure goodness, because what that allows you to do is run R inside stored procedures right in your database engine which is so awesome. You can do so many cool things with that. Yeah. yeah, I'm not surprised that they're adding Python. But right now, with 2016, um, and again, I'll admit another bias. Uh, I've worked with SQL Server both as a Microsoft employee and both as a non-Microsoft employee for most of my career. So I like that database product. So that's one of my biases. Um, other database products also incorporate R. For example, SAP's HANA database also runs R in the engine as well. So that's another server-side deployment option for you as well. But the ubiquity of, of relational databases makes it an excellent deployment vehicle for production systems. It co-locates all the advanced processing with data in your data marts and your data warehouses and your transactional databases. It also makes it very easy for your application developers to invoke that code as well, because if it's wrapped as a stored procedure, they already know how to work with stored procedures. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. It looks like you can actually run it on Amazon also. Yeah, I'm not surprised. As you might imagine, I'm not as familiar with Amazon as maybe you would think, given my background. No, actually, I was going to the free side. That's what I was actually wondering. Oh. You don't want to get people sent over. Yeah, well, so the thing to remember, too, though, is that if you run our server side, which you're going to want from an enterprise setting, you're going to want a lot of stuff that you normally care about. How reliable is it? How secure is it? All that kind of stuff. So you can always run R, just plain vanilla open source R on the server. You can do that. You can buy a big box and just put R on there. But are you going to get all the enterprise characteristics from an operational perspective that you want? That's where things get, that's where things get more difficult. I will stay as long as people have questions. When's the next session? So the next session is going to be is it June seventh, Blair. Something like that. So I think it's June seventh, and the topic is going to, most likely going to be um, machine learning with R in the carrot package. Right. And the carrot package is a is a is a meta wrapper that makes doing machine learning in, in R much easier. I'm not going to say easy because that wouldn't be true, but make it easier. What so. level will that be for us newbies at R? What level will that be for us newbies at R? Um, it'll be advanced. It will be advanced. Um, I will try to be entertaining as always in my style. Hopefully not so many bugs as we saw with Excel. Uh, but it will be relatively advanced because we're talking about machine learning, right? So if you look back at our history of our meetups, some of them are more advanced, like we did event log mining in R, that's a little more advanced, and then the past few have been a little bit more not as advanced, and so now we're kind of swinging back to the, you know, because we have a diverse community of folks, right? Some folks are more interested in the advanced stuff, so. Okay. I'm, I'm being apologetic. I'm so sorry. I apologetic. Yeah. 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 So we'll talk about things like how you do stratified random sampling, how you build models, 
how to use cross-validation to, to tune the hyperparameters to make your models better, I mean, stuff like that. So, yeah. yeah, no problem. Anybody else? I will also stay after if people just want to ask me questions one-on-one -on -one as well. So if there's nothing else, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. My Excel